Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and we're live on YouTube. Uh, today is March 2nd. I hope everybody is enjoying March. I hope the weather's great wherever you are. It looks like we're marching through the winter. And, um, well, what can I say? Some people are on spring break. A number of uh, faculty are at or are coming back from the uh, GI Society meeting in Austin, Texas, which I heard was very well attended, so that's great. Um, and today what I'm going to speak to you about is incidental illness. Now, we've spoken about that before. If you go on CT as Us, I always, every couple of years, update my talk on incidental illness. It's a very practical part of radiology because as scanners get better, the more incidental illness you find. Incidental illness are findings that were not the reason for doing the study. Now, the challenge with incidental illness is that it could be a critical finding that's good or a critical finding that's bad or just something that's just a pain in the neck. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, let me tell you. We talk about incidental findings that can be important, right? It could save your life. We could pick up an incidental lung cancer, an incidental renal cell carcinoma, an incidental um, colon cancer. You can go on and on. Every organ has incidental findings. A incidental early pancreatic cancer. Again, saving people's lives. Early detection of pancreatic cancer, you know, 70 plus percent survival, not 11 percent. So that's great. But we also pick up a lot of findings that aren't important. You think about lung nodules. Remember, you have to follow 365 lung nodules to pick up one cancer. Most lung nodules incidentally found that are smaller granulomas. They're not important, but you follow them. What about these tiny pancreatic lesions like IPMNs? Only 3% of IPMNs ever become cancer. It's rare. But all of a sudden, we now say that if you pick up an IPMN, you need to do a um, follow-up for a minimum of 10 years. Yet, without a family history, incidental finding, well-defined lesion, water density, it's an IPMN. Nothing's going to happen. It could grow over time. But do you need to follow all those? And we pick up incidental renal lesions, right? Now people agree that under a CM, don't worry about it or just follow it. But 25% of patients with lesions under 3 CM who went to surgery would have a benign lesion, often high-density cysts, lipid poor myelolipoma, adenoma, all sorts of things. So finding something is not necessarily a panacea. It can cause all sorts of grief, result in additional surgeries and biopsies and treatments and stress and heartburn for the patient and for the doctor. What about the adrenal? Well, the adrenal is a classic incidental finding. Way back when with adrenal lesions, we pick them up, we follow them like we follow the lung nodule six months, then one year, then two year follow up and forget about it. Adenomas can grow, so maybe that's not a good strategy. When you think about it, the majority of adrenal lesions you're going to see in practice in cancer patients and non cancer patients, especially in non cancer patients, are going to be adenomas. They're just benign lesions, they're nothing to worry about. The question is, how do you separate adenomas from non-adenomas? If it's an adenoma, we leave it alone. Now, I'm also going to speak to you as a radiologist, and, I'm, and I'll show you why my comments are such. How do we determine something's an adenoma? Three or four centimeter lesion, well-defined, low density, non-contrast, or even with contrast, measuring under 10 Hounsfield units is an adenoma next case. Some adenomas are lipid poor. But then we look at washout. You get a scan at time zero. You can get contrast 60 seconds and 15 minutes. You look for a 60% or greater washout. If a lesion washes out, it's an adenoma. Of course, we have that one limitation that if it enhances above 120, and some people say 110, and washes out, it doesn't count because pheos wash out very extensively, and you don't want to miss a pheo. Majority of pheos are incidental findings. They're not patients with hypertension or being evaluated for hypertension at that point. So adenomas can be, so incidental findings can be important. And the adenoma problem is a really big problem. So radiology, as I said, we look at size, we look at enhancement and washout. Then we say adenoma, stop. 
Now, remember, these are not patients who present to us with Cushing's or Addisonian crisis or patients who present to us with hypertension, right? Then it's a whole different story. You have adrenal lesion that's a sonometer. I don't care what it looks like. You've got to worry. It's a cancer. I've seen two one sonometer cancers this year in young women who had Cushing's, okay? So it's possible you need to be very careful about the functioning side of things. Now, remember, as incidental findings, we're not having any information about functioning, nor was there any symptoms about that, right? Typically, it's just an incidental finding. Now, as I said, radiology, we look at size and enhancement, leave alone, follow up, or do something is how we think about it. But the Endocrinologist Society has published different articles. What they say is when you pick up an incidental adrenal lesion, even though it looks like an adenoma, and it is an adenoma, but maybe it's a functioning adenoma. So their thing is picking up a lesion, maybe you're lucky for that patient that you've picked up a functioning, functioning adrenal lesion, be it Theo or be it a uh, Cushing's or anything else. So what the Endocrinology Society says is when you get an incidental lesion, you know, yes, look at the washout, look at all those things, but then get lab values. That's the only way you can exclude that it's not a functioning tumor. Now, we don't do that. Some places like Cleveland Clinic, I'm told in their report on an incidental adrenal lesion, they'll recommend lab values. Lab values are not inexpensive, particularly when you're doing those uh, endocrine workup. It's very expensive. And then the second thing is who's going to see the patient? You can't just get a lab value. Who's ordering it? Are you referring every incidental adrenal lesion to the endocrinologist or to a group of people who the ER docs, they don't want to do that. Uh, internists, they don't want to do that. So you need to send them to an endocrinologist. Well, endocrinologists are limited in supply and they're very busy. If they looked at all the incidental findings and all the incidental patients, they wouldn't get to the patients who they're supposed to take care of. So it's really a very interesting problem. What do you do in your practice? If a patient comes in with an incidental lesion, it looks like an adenoma, do you say adenoma, stop, goodbye? Or do you advise correlation clinically with lab values. Well, the patient's long gone. The patient has no clinician. They would have to bring the patient back, call them back to get lab values, and then someone see the patient. And then, of course, you know, lab values sometimes are borderline. What do you do exactly? It's a very interesting problem. Long-term, will AI help, perhaps? Well, AI can help two different ways, potentially. One way, analyze adrenal lesions and say which ones are concerning for function and which ones aren't. That could be helpful. The second thing is maybe you, you'll order this profile and then you would go to the computer and AI would say, oh, this adrenal lesion with these lab values is nothing. Stop. Goodbye. Or this group of patients get triaged to an endocrinologist so you make better use of your resources. Use of resources as well as not stressing patients out is a very, very important thing. Um, and so we need to figure out ways of doing it better. And I think that's the point. Think about what do you do in your practice? Do you worry about functioning lesions if there's no history? Do you make the suggestion about getting lab values? Is that what your institution recommends? Is that what your endocrinologists recommend? Not many places do, but it's a very good question. Now, if you have any questions, you can ask me and hear from Sina Delazar. Uh, can we call adrenal nodule containing gross fat and myelipoma? In theory, you could have fat in a adrenal cortical carcinoma, but I agree with you. When you have fat in a cort an adrenal cortical carcinoma or ACC, there's lots of neovascularity present. The lesion's large. It's irregular. When you have gross fat in a well-defined lesion, maybe some punctate calcifications, it's going to be a myelolipoma. Yes, I've seen uh, liposarcomas simulate myelolipomas. That's really rare as well. I think gross fat, a lesion, uh, well-defined, maybe punctate calcification, it's a myelolipoma. Fat that occurs in a FEO, very rare, or an ACC, but less rare. There's lots of other features that put you in the correct ballpark. So that becomes very important. And let's see, in your practice, um, I just answer that question. Okay. Um, 
anyway, um, that, if, anyone, if no one has any questions, I'll stop there. Uh, there's a couple good talks I gave on adrenal lesions just in the past few months, or maybe they've just been put up or they're about to be put up. That's a good thing to look at. I spoke also about large adrenal masses. Remember, the bigger the mass, the more you worry, but only 20% of masses over 5 cm are actually malignant. There's a lot of benign lesions from adenomas that have bled to myelolipomas, to cysts, and the like. So, so again, important things to think about. So with that, I'll hope you all have a great day. Those of you on the East Coast, it's 1241. So it's sort of lunchtime or just time to read, time to catch up. And I have a meeting uh, evaluating grants from one to five. So with that, I thank everybody for their attention and hope everybody has a great day. Bye, guys.